Martial law, EMPs, collapse of the economy, increase in natural disasters, tsunamis, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions. They will stop at nothing until they achieve their ominous goal. And when the final card is in place, a new world order, then comes the Antichrist. Antichrist. Hi, it's Lynn Liaz, and today we have Gary Ka. Now, Gary has been on over a thousand different programs, radio and TV, since the 1980s, including the Sid Roth Show, Rick Wiles, and more. I mean, that's just a few trying to spread the warning to people about what's coming and that we need to repent. He is a former Europe and Middle East trade specialist for the Indiana state government. Now, while he was in that position, he traveled extensively overseas, working closely with the economic staff at American embassies on trade-related projects. It was during that time when he learned of efforts underway to establish a one-world political financial system. He also discovered there was a religious motivation connected with these endeavors. Now, he's going to be discussing these things, and he's got a a recent article he published about what we're seeing going on in the the presidential election and more that we're also going to talk about. Now, as a side note, Gary has written two best-selling books detailing his experiences and explaining the goals of the One World Interfaith Movement. His books, En Route to Global Occupation and The New World Religion, are fully documented and are critical in understanding today's global developments, including the unfolding financial crisis and rapidly changing events in the Middle East. He does keep interested readers informed of the latest international economic, political, and religious developments through his research news journal, Hope for the World Update. Now, you can visit Gary. Be sure and check out his website. He always has great articles, like the one we're going to talk about tonight, that was written on March 14th of this year. It's called America's Reckoning, and I got done reading it a little bit ago. It's a very powerful article. Please visit him at www.garyka.org, and that is G is in good, A is in apple, R Y K A is in apple, H dot org, garyka.org, G A R Y K A H. Please visit his website and check out all the information he has there. Now, Gary, uh, first of all, I was reading your article that you put out in March called America's Reckoning. And this year's presidential race is phenomenal, very, very important. And in fact, you uh, discussed that in your article. I would love for you to share with the listeners a lot of what you discussed in the article and a lot of the points that you um, touched on about the different candidates and what your thoughts were. I understand you spent a ton of time praying about it before you wrote the article and seeking God's direction, and you talked about repentance and much more. Could you go ahead and share with everyone what you had written about? Yes. uh, First of all, Lynn, thank you so much for having me on your program. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, there is so much going on. Um, we, we've been monitoring things as best as we can, including some of the developments behind the scenes. Um, I, I think the only thing that has surprised me in a major way so far was the fact that uh, Cruz dropped out when he did. Um, everything I was uh, hearing and what we thought was that he was probably going to stay in until the national uh, convention. Uh, but now that that is... is um, uh, the case, and that Trump has, it appears, a pretty clear path. Um, it, it looks all but certain that uh, the race is going to be between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, uh, unless um, uh, the FBI investigation, uh, the results of it are presented in such a way that are really negative for her, or if she is even indicted. Uh, most people don't think that's going to happen, but it could. We'll have to wait and see. 
if it does, if, if um, there is enough negative information that comes out uh, through the FBI regarding Hillary that it damages her enough that it puts Trump in a sizable lead to where it looks like he actually is going to win the race, then in a strange kind of way, I think it's actually going to uh, put us in, in a potentially dangerous situation, and here's why. I believe the powers that be that are strongly pushing the global agenda, uh, the push toward world government uh, behind the scenes and now increasingly out in the open, um, they have worked hard to get their agenda to where it is right now under Obama. And if they believe that that door could close on them, even temporarily, where uh, someone like Trump potentially could undo some of uh, what they have done, uh, they may may try to intervene before that can happen. And I don't want to make any dire predictions here, but I'm just saying we're moving into a time period uh, that could be very unstable and where just about anything could happen. And, and I believe all of us need to be in prayer and walking closely with the Lord, because I believe yeah, from this summer forward uh, through the end of the year and even into next year, uh, we're entering a very unstable, potentially unstable period of time, uh, because if uh, the globalists operating behind the scenes believe that Trump potentially could undo some of um, uh, their agenda and set them back, uh, then there may be an effort to try to rush forward uh, now before anything else happens. Uh, on the other hand, ironically, if they as having a few more years to accomplish their agenda under her. So um, depending on how the summer's conventions uh, go, and depending on whether Hillary is indicted or not or where she stands in the polls, uh, again, if it looks like uh, Trump has a clear path, um, I, I think we're in for some interesting uh, times. And I hope that nothing happens in our country, and I don't want to be an alarmist at all, but I am saying this, the potential for uh, manipulation and, and for uh, various attacks occurring in our country to try to create a crisis. Uh, it, is, it is a very real possibility, and we need to be prepared for that. So it's a time for uh, Christians to walk repentantly before the Lord and, and just draw close to Him and be very discerning at this uh, stage in our nation and in our world's history. Well, that's certainly true. And we're also seeing this one-world religion Interfaith coming into fruition, uh, Chrislam. And actually, I saw you on Sid Roth talking about Chrislam and some of the things you found out about the elitist agenda and, uh, and more information, too, that was very, very interesting and things that people really need to be watching and praying about. Could you share with the listeners um, some of the subjects you were talking about on Sid Roth about this whole new world order and um, you know the United Nations and the one world religion. Yes, um, uh, there is a very strong push uh, to unite the world's religions, at least to get them cooperating uh, closely enough together uh, that the religions of the world would not be standing in the way of a world government. If if the ultimate goal is to have a political and economic world government. And if religion will be part of that, which I believe it will be based on Revelation 13 and 14, in fact, ultimately, it's all about religion. I believe Satan wants to receive uh, the worship of mankind and lead mankind in a direct rebellion against, uh, against uh, Christ at the Battle of Armageddon when, when Christ returns. And, and so ultimately, it is about religion. Uh, so somehow Satan has to try to uh, to deceive uh, the religions of the world into coming together and and um, making a, a political system possible through which he can then control the people of the world. And so uh, interfaithism is where most of the effort is going right now because this is where uh, the powers that be have had the greatest difficulty in bringing about a new world order. It's one thing to try to. Uh, unify the world economically and politically, and that's difficult enough. But to try to get the religions of the world together, uh, that's even a greater challenge. And uh, for the last few years now, there has been a lot of uh, movement in that area uh, through various organizations. And uh, perhaps the, the biggest challenge, those in favor of global government, has been to get Christianity and Islam together on the same page. 
And so numerous meetings have been held. And you can actually go back to um, the year 2000, late August of the year 2000. Uh, there was a significant meeting held at the United Nations at which over a 1,000 religious leaders from uh, all around the world representing the world's religions came together. And there was a strong to uh, get them working together, cooperating together. And not everybody came on board at that meeting, uh, but much has happened since that time. And uh, just a few years ago, for example, um, King Abdullah of Jordan, together with Prince Ghazi of Jordan, um, introduced something called World Interfaith Harmony Week. Uh, it was in the month of October a few years ago. And they were trying to get the UN to designate such a week each year, again called World Interfaith Harmony Week. And the UN came on board in the first week of February now each year is World Interfaith Harmony Week in which interfaithism is celebrated and promoted and uh, they do everything they can to bring uh, the world's religions together. Um, that was based on something called the Common Word Program. That was kind of the inspiration for World Interfaith Harmony Week. And Common Word Program is really a Muslim call uh, for religious unity and cooperation with Christians. Well, in response to the Common Word Program and the World Interfaith Harmony Week, a number of Christians got together, in fact, over 300 of them in all, uh, to endorse a document uh, called Loving God and Neighbor Together. Now, that sounds harmless enough, but that was really the Christian response document to Common Word, uh, signaling cooperation with the Muslim community. And along with um, uh, the more than 300 different organizations and individuals who signed on to that, uh, they received an endorsement from the National Association of Evangelicals on that. So, it's, I mean, some of this is so bizarre, it's, hard, it's just hard to believe that it's even really happening. And out of all this has, has come the so-called Chrislamic movement, uh, where you have many of the emergent church leaders like Brian McLaren and, and, and various others uh, that are in some cases even celebrating Ramadan together with Islamic friends. And I can tell you, I have, I have no problem with Christians reaching out to people of other religions. I think we should. We should do so. I believe the Apostle Paul would have done that. But when uh, you cross the line of actually engaging in their celebration, in their religious rituals and celebrations with them, uh, that is completely out of bounds. And, and for a true Christian, they should not be. Yeah, people need to understand what these people are doing that are quote-unquote Christians they're actually accepting, it's not to preach to them or to win them over. Some of them will even claim that's what it is. It's basically getting involved and partaking in it with them to make peace. And this is unbiblical. And as we know, Satan can appear as an angel of light. So the way they're going about it is very alluring and sounds peaceful. And my goodness, if you stand against it, you're just uh, you're just being, uh, you know, trying to make trouble is is what they try to make us out to be. In fact, I believe um, a couple of years ago, um, there was word that all over the news, people were trying to say that Christians are terrorists, <laughs> you know, or we're the same, we're just as dangerous. You know, not, we're not doing anything but trying to get the truth out to people because, um, you know, we want to try to keep them from spending their eternity in hell. And we want people to be prepared. Sorry for the interruption. Go ahead, Gary. No, I, I, I completely agree with you. Um, m most of this agenda is taking place in the name of peace and unity, and that's the deception, because in the end, uh, it'll be anything but about peace and unity. Um, and, and so Christians cannot make the mistake of falling for this deception. Uh, you know, and, and, and again, in Matthew 24, uh, Jesus warned that even the elect could be deceived if that were possible. And much of Matthew chapter 24 is actually a warning to the end times church uh, of things taking place in the name of Christ, but not being of Christ. And so just because people call themselves Christians and speak in the name of Christ does not mean that they are speaking. And I didn't understand this for, for, for years early on, but I, I certainly do now. And I believe that's where the biggest deception is going to take place. And many naive people who aren't prepared are going to go along with all of this. So, you know, shame on those um, so-called Christian leaders that are throwing their hats in the ring on this. And, and maybe some of them are doing so naively, not realizing where it's all going. 
uh, and they're not doing their homework and, and researching um, uh, the, the key figures involved and, and where they're coming from on this. Um, well, I, you know what that's about. It's because a lot of these, um, a lot of Christian ministers these days, uh, they do not study Bible prophecy. They don't even want to talk about it. They're afraid to even touch it. They don't want to offend anybody. And, um, you know, the Bible tells us specifically Revelation three fifteen through 17, and this is the New King James Version. It says, I know your works that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. And I'm sorry, that was uh, 15 and 16. Now, I don't know about you, but and when I say you, I'm talking about the listeners, but I don't want to know what it would be like to be vomited out of God's mouth. That sounds horrible. And we are dealing today with the lukewarm church, this church that wants to be somewhere in between. And there's this great, I was discussing with you before we started recording, the deception about the false judgment stuff that's basically leading a lot of people from uh, astray from telling the truth. We can't have political correctness in the church. We have to tell the truth with love because the truth sets the people free. And so people aren't repenting because they're not getting convicted. And unfortunately, it takes conviction in order to bring about repentance. And repentance brings about true salvation. That you're right on. And, and in the first few chapters of the book of Revelation, the key is in, in the letters, uh, uh, the warnings to the churches, um, it's to repent. No matter how far they've gone, it's like the Lord is giving them uh, another chance. He's saying, repent, turn from where you are and repent. That's what it's all about. And I do believe even at this late hour, if, if the people of America truly repented and turned back to God, that the Lord would give us more time. I don't see that happening right now on a large scale, only among a remnant. And in fact, right now, as we're speaking, it seems like our country is going from bad to worse very quickly. I mean, some of the things on the news every day are almost unbelievable. You think, is this really going on in America? You know, the biggest debate right now over the transgender bathroom issue. And, and when I travel out of the country to other countries and I see that on the news of, uh, you know, the fact that that's going on back in the U.S., and we were supposed to Christian roots, and, and the world's looking at us, and we're, in their eyes, we've become a sex-crazed nation, where every other news story now has something to do with sexuality in the United States, either on the issue of homosexuality or, or transgenderism, and it's just, you know, I think all of this is a sign of the times, the push toward global government, the immorality, uh, the preoccupation with with self and, and pleasing oneself sensually in every way, shape, or form without regard for any of the consequences. All of these things are a sign of the times, and also the fact that uh, people calling themselves Christians are actually uh, teaching apostate ideas. Um, I want to turn just a, a little bit. Well, you want to hear you want to hear something real quick that happened to me just tonight. Go ahead. A, a gentleman added me to his Facebook page. It was some news Facebook page and added me as an editor. And all of a sudden I go to get on Facebook and it had logged me out. And I'm like, uh oh, this can't be good. When it logs you out, it means there's a problem. So I'm having to log in. They basically lo temporarily had locked me out of my account and made me read their policies because a commentator on this other person's page posted something negative about homosexuality. And they said, and they even posted the comment for me and showed it to me. And they told me that I violated my page, and it's not even my page, violated Facebook's standards. And that I needed to review the policies because a commentator said something negative about homosexuality. Does this surprise me? No. But what that means is I'm seeing... I'm definitely seeing, uh, you know, a pathway here and the opening of doors to more co control from the government and persecution on Christians and what we're allowed to say, because I didn't even say anything. Someone else did, but apparently we can't mention something negative about homosexuality now on Facebook. Yeah, in, in my recent article, I, I wrapped up one of, one of the paragraphs. I said, every discerning Christian knows this and can already feel the heat Short of an all-out war where constitutionalists come out on top, 
a victory which would not be guaranteed. America's days of religious freedom are numbered. The persecution of Christians is coming. Expect it. Um, you know, we, we were in Israel last year, and we noticed how so many Jews are fleeing France now because of what's going on there, the persecution that has started. And 10 years ago, none of them really saw it coming, but now you've got tens of thousands of, of Jews uh, leaving Paris and the areas around there, and many of them are ending up in, in Netanya, which is a coastal city in, in Israel. And when we were there and I saw that, I thought, you know, how long will it be until Christians are having to flee certain countries? I mean, you look at what is going on in the Middle East right now, and four years ago, we didn't even know the name ISIS. Uh, you know, and, and you look at how uh, uh, believers are having their heads chopped off for believing that Jesus is the only way, and and yet the world is propagating the idea that the real problem is with Bible-believing Christians, that we're the ones that people need to be concerned about, and yet it's Christians who are getting their heads chopped off. And it has come to the point where the truth has been turned upside down, where evil is now called good and good is, is being called evil. And in the United States, with so much of, of the secular media uh, helping to bro- propagate pol- um, political correctness and uh, is, is really silencing uh, Christians or making Christians f- uh, look like fools, really, for speaking the truth, I think we need to be able to see the handwriting on the wall and know that the time is coming where um, we're going to pay an enormous price for speaking the truth. And that's why it's important now to get the message out while we can, because I don't believe we're always going to have that opportunity. Um, I I wanted to to, uh, shift just a little bit. It's in the same vein, but something that people need to know about. And and some of your listeners, Lynn, may already be aware of this, but one of the things I came across in my research was – it had to do with the Tony Blair Foundation. Um, uh, Tony Blair, after he stepped down as Britain's prime minister, he started a uh, really an interfaith foundation. Uh, he calls it a faith foundation, but it's really an interfaith foundation. And he has publicly stated that he wants to devote the rest of his life to doing what, in his opinion, is the most important uh, thing that he can do with his life, which is to help unify the world's religions. And so on his board of directors, he has people from various world religions, uh, including an Islamic cleric, and sitting on the board there with him is, is Rick Warren. And many people, you know, refer to Rick Warren as being America's pastor. And I, I actually agree with much of what he says. Not everything he says is, is wrong. Uh, but for, for someone of his prominence to be on the board of an organization whose leader has stated that his primary purpose is to, is to unite the world's religions, uh, people need to be aware of this, um, because at some future point, uh, you're going to have people like Rick Warren and potentially others, uh, in a more open way, perhaps, uh, promote interfaithism. Uh, but even now, it's being done uh, in, in a fairly flagrant type of way. Um, I don't know how else... What to- happened with Kenneth Copeland on that? Because I had heard Kenneth Copeland was starting to partake in that. And luckily, now as a kid growing up, Copeland had a huge impact on my life because my parents watched him all the time. I mean, that man preaches with fire and zeal. And to finally find out that Kenneth Copeland was was joining with the Pope and and all this stuff was heartbreaking. And it's amazing how his supporters who know the truth will back him because they're they're looking at Kenneth Copeland and looking to him and serving him, kind of idolizing him over God, because we serve God. And if we see a, uh, a minister doing something like that, then we need to know that that's wrong and be very cautious. But have you heard any more about that, just out of curiosity, about Kenneth Copeland? I have not heard the latest regarding his position on that, but I can tell you this. Uh, currently, under uh, Pope Francis, uh, he's pulling out all the stops to try to bring about global religious unity. I mean, he is really going for it. And um, it, so nothing really should surprise us. Um, he's really pushing for unity with Islam. He's been having private meetings with Islamic leaders over the last few months. And uh, some of this is beginning to uh, eke out in the, in the main press and, and, and secular media. But usually they're presenting it from a positive standpoint. Um, I believe this can't be good for Israel long term. Uh, there's a very strong push now uh, behind the scenes at the United Nations 
uh, to try to bring about uh, uh, Jerusalem, to make East Jerusalem the capital of a Palestinian state. In the past, the United States has stood in the way of this U.N. Security Council resolution. Uh, this time, the U.S. might not do so. If the U.S. throws their hat in the ring, um, then uh, this will become official, and it will be very difficult to undo. And then depending on the reaction from uh, the Israeli administration, what we could expect to see, if not this year, in the, in the fairly near future, is an effort to internationalize Jerusalem, where the U.N. Would, uh, or another global body would try to have international troops stationed there to enforce the peace, uh, and I put peace in quotes, in return, Israel would have to give something up. So you would, uh, Israel would have to be willing to um, yield East Jerusalem to make it the capital of the Palestinian state, but in return, perhaps, they would be given permission to rebuild their temple on the Temple Mount, and so there will be some give and take. And, you know, the Israeli people, they're so tired of war, and the, the world um, constantly uh, badgering them and making them look like they're the warmongers, and so I could see a point in the future where, where finally Israel's leaders capitulate and say, okay, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll go along with this agreement in the name of peace. But I, I believe it's going to be very subtle, but it will not be good for, for the uh, nation Israel. Uh, but this, this current pope, as well as the top UN leaders, are pushing this agenda. So unfortunately, it's probably just a matter of time till, till something gets pushed through. And it depends on uh, on Obama right now and what he tries to do uh, before he leaves office, if he leaves office, and if uh, 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 a new candidate is elected and they actually take office, uh, we'll have to wait and see what their position will be on this. Uh, so that's something else to, to watch, because there is a strong interfaith push behind this. Uh, the same people would like to make Jerusalem the interfaith capital of the world. And part of the reason for that, I believe, is um, it, Jerusalem is important to Christians, to Jews, to Muslims, and so it's kind of the ideal uh, city from their standpoint to bring together this, uh, this interfaithism, this push for, for uh, one world uh, religion or, or cooperation among the world's religions. So that, too, I believe, is a, um, a prophetic development. And... Um, uh, when we get off the air to read Zechariah chapter 12 and also chapter 14, which <clears throat> uh, indicates how important Jerusalem would be in the last days. But what I like about those chapters is it reveals how Jesus Christ is his return will be victorious and uh, uh, the Jewish people uh, will embrace him, and it's not over. In other words, this world government and interfaithism, this is all yet to come. But on the other side of this, you're going to have the Lord return and put a stop to these things, and we will then witness his millennial reign. And that's the good news. But between now and then, things are going to get difficult, and there's no way around that. It, it's just the truth, and people need to be told the truth so they can be prepared to take a, a stand under potentially different uh, or difficult circumstances for the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, and there are a lot of people out there who think it's wrong to share these things because to them it feels negative and they just want to hear the flowery things that make them feel good. Well, I'm not about a feel-good message. I'm about what God once said and once heard and what God wants us to put out there. And so, you know, ultimately, and I'm always saying this all the time, people do not realize that God's judgment is one of the greatest acts of his love because God is more concerned about our soul than he is this physical body because our soul is going to spend eternity either in heaven or in hell. And if God has to, you know, toss mountains into the sea and open up the earth, and cause great things to happen to get people's attention so that they will repent. That is a great act of his love because he does not want people to go to hell. God doesn't send people to hell. God gives us our own free will. We choose to follow Satan and his lies to hell, or we choose to repent and turn to God and pick up our cross and carry it. You know, people have this idea that picking up our cross and carrying it 
is no different than carrying a sack of potatoes home on the way on the way home from the grocery store. You know, Jesus suffered. He endured pain. I mean, he was dehydrated. He had been lashed and beaten to a pulp. Um, he was he had hypovolemic shock. You know, he had lost a lot of blood. He hadn't eaten, um, beat up, spit upon, knocked down, kicked, you name it. And he had to carry that heavy wooden cross on his shoulders all the way to Calvary. That was painful. And then knowing that he would be tormented further and have nails driven through his hands and his feet and hung on a cross, that's how hard it is. So when we're told, pick up our cross and carry it, it is painful sometimes to turn away from sin. You know, like, let's look at fornication or sexual sin. You're in the moment of the throes of passion. You have to say, no, I can't do this. I'm not married. I can't do this with this person. This is wrong. You know, a lot of people are out there fornicating or, you know, having sexual relations outside of marriage. And it's painful at that moment to to stand back and say, I can't do this. Or it's painful to quit smoking cigarettes or to quit drinking alcohol because you have an alcohol problem, whatever the case may be. It can be painful, but we have to tell the truth and we have to be honest with ourselves and we have to be honest with God because He knows everything anyways, but He wants us to tell the truth to Him, even though we know He knows. And we have to repent. And it's going to hurt right at first. But the truth will set us free. And in the end of it all, God will help us through these things. And He's going to set us free. And we're going to look back at those mountains that are way behind us. And we're going to say, you know what? Praise the Lord. It was hard. It was the hardest thing I ever did. But I did it. And I'll tell you, for me, when I've gone through repentance and things I've had to give up, the hardest part, like with cigarettes, the hardest part was when I would try to quit smoking the cigarettes. And I, the next day, you know, I told myself, I'm going to wake up tomorrow and not smoke. I'm not going to buy any. So here comes the next day. When you're at that moment where you want that cigarette, at that moment, you're going to make up your mind one way or the other, that you're going to go buy some or you're going to submit to God. And the hardest part is calling on God for his help at that moment when you want that thing. That's the hardest part is saying, God, help me right now. Help me in getting through it. I just want to say, I don't know, I felt led to say that uh, for some reason. I think that there's a lot of people that are really caught up in sin, and maybe they have personal situations that's making it difficult. Like maybe they're in a lease and they're living with somebody or outside of marriage or whatnot. They have their their difficult situations. It could be money. And, uh, you know, what's more important You know, if you do, if you stand for God and stand for the truth, God is going to help you. He is going to open doors for you, but you have to lean on Him and trust Him. And I'm sorry, Gary, I didn't mean to get carried away, but I just felt led to say that. No, I agree completely with you. And, you know, we have to remind ourselves that we live and see the here and now, but God sees the eternal picture. And as Christians, we need to seek out the Lord and abide in Him and walk closely with Him. And as we do and as we draw closer and closer to Him, we begin to see the eternal perspective more and more. And that is a a huge help in all of this. It it, it gives us a a comprehensive bird's-eye view. You know, we're just here for such a a brief period of time, but eternity goes on for forever. Uh, we, We can't really get our our minds around that. Um, But what we do in this world, the decisions we make, whether we uh, uh, accept Jesus Christ and walk repentantly with Him, or whether we completely shun Him and reject His truth, is going to determine where we spend eternity. And because God loves us, He wants us to know the truth and then to act on that truth. And and I know that's why you do your program. That's why I write and speak out as, as, as I do. And we're going to take some heat for, for doing that, you know. I mean, it's uh, – and, and Jesus warned us about that. Um, he said, you know, how much more so will you as my servants uh, suffer if, 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 um, if I suffer these things? And, and then you go ahead and you look at what happened to uh, Jesus' uh, disciples. 
Um, all of all but one of them died a martyr's death, and 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 uh, the apostle Paul as well. And I'm not saying we need to dwell on that all the time, but um, you know when people preach the prosperity gospel that when you become a Christian, then all of a sudden everything goes great for you and you get into this positive thinking mode and you never uh, judge anyone or say anything uh, to take a stand on anything because it might make waves. And, and, and they go down that whole path. And, and I just think, what Bible are they reading? You know, that's not what the Word of God says. We are to take a stand. We're to do so in love. Uh, we are to examine ourselves and, and make sure that we're walking closely with the Lord uh, and not be hypocritical. And um, uh, But if we're walking with the Lord, He's going to call for, uh, on us to take a stand. And, and people don't want to do that because it's, it's difficult. And uh, they also generally don't want to repent because that means also sacrificing something that we want to have or, or that we want to do at that uh, point in time, just as you've already shared. It's amazing how people will actually take the scriptures and take them out of context and twist them around to conform to the sin that they are partaking in. And I'm sure we've all at some point or another in our lives done similar or done things. But, um, you know, what I see is this this whole prosperity message. I tell people when they get saved or when I whenever I've led someone to the Lord, I tell them straight up, look, when you get saved, it doesn't necessarily get easier. It does get easier in one aspect, and it gets harder in another. And here's how I explain it to them. I tell them we are the light, we are the light in the darkness because we have the Holy Spirit. And Satan and his demons live in the darkness. And the brighter the light, the more of a threat. So the more on fire you are for God, and when that light comes on, when you accept Christ, the light comes on. The closer you get to God, the more obedient, the brighter your light shines. You're more of a threat. And He's going to come after you and put stumbling blocks in your path. He's going to try to cause things to happen. But here's the better part. The better part is now you have God on your side. And if God is for us, who then can be against us? And no matter how hard it seems or how rough the road is, God is going to make sure that, you know, that in the end of all things, you're blessed. And ultimately, we're going to spend eternity in heaven when we obey God and we, we, we accept Christ as our Savior. And, you know, that's, I try to tell people, you now have God to turn to. You now have the Holy Spirit to lean on. You don't have to do it on your own. That's the easier part. But it does not necessarily get easier to walk the Christian walk, especially in a world that is filled with so much sin and corruption, and you've got all sorts of sinful things thrown in your face daily. You can't even go to the grocery store and stand in line without seeing sex in your face. So I try to tell people that. Well, you know, a, a, a good, encouraging verse, it's one of my favorites, is, is James one twelve. It says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And it reminds us that um, accepting Christ, it becomes a lifelong walk and, and journey, and it's not always going to be easy, but the Lord blesses those who persevere for His name's sake. And there is a reward that comes at the end. And in, in 1 Timothy 6.12, we're told to fight the good fight of the faith, indicating that it is, in, in fact, a, a battle. Um, but in 2 Timothy 1.7, the Lord says, for, or, or Paul wrote to, uh, to Timothy, For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind. And sometimes we need to remind ourselves, in fact, we need to do so daily, uh, that the power of God is available. The Lord is there for us. He wants to help us. And sometimes we don't call out to Him when we are tempted in a sin, and we rely just on our own strength. But uh, as you've already mentioned, when we're, we're tempted or, or tested, we need to call out to the Lord and, and trust and depend on Him to, to get us through, and He will do so. He is faithful. Amen. And I was looking, I'd like to share something from one of your articles. I guess you wrote this one a few years ago. It was called America's Moral, what was the section of the article that says America's Moral Failure. Do you mind if I share that section real quick with the listeners? No, go, go right ahead, Lynn. I really love what you had to say in this article here. Okay. And the part, this part of the article, it says America's moral failure. I want you all who are listening to take this seriously, and I want you to listen to what he wrote. 
He writes, while it is noble to love one's country, we must realize that a sudden burst of patriotism will not win the coming war, nor will celebrating the resilience of the human spirit and displaying God bless America banners if we do not honor him. Holding interfaith prayer vigils and services will not help either. God will not tolerate the acceptance of false deities. He will not respond to prayers offered in the joint names of Muhammad and Jesus Christ. Such practices are a mockery unto him. It is because of these very things that God lifts his hand of protection from a people. God provides salvation only through Jesus Christ, not through Buddha, Krishna, Muhammad, or anyone else. And then um, he provided verses, uh, 1 Timothy, Mark, John, uh, and a couple others. Among with... Per- Along, excuse me, along with pursuing false gods and occult practices, America is guilty of many other sins. Never in history has a nation declined so fast morally. In one generation, she has gone from being a predominantly Christian nation and a moral leader to being a center of depravity. Her pornography and sex-crazed culture is being exported around the world, assisted by the Internet. Her greed, pride, and arrogance have become infamous. Her great liberties have been abused to pave the way for every type of sinful indulgence. She behaves as if she is the queen of the world, but she has become a haunt for every unclean spirit. We, America, have led the world to drink of the maddening wine of our adulteries. In the early 1990s, and I love what you say here, uh, Gary, about Dimitri uh, Dudeman. Yes. In the early 1990s, I met a Romanian pastor while visiting friends in Wisconsin. He was not afraid to speak his mind. He was deeply disappointed and discouraged by what he saw in the United States and how it was affecting his homeland. Dimitri said, Freedom has allowed wonderful things in Romania, such as the preaching of the gospel and large crusades, the building of churches, and the freedom to distribute Bibles and Christian literature. But freedom has also greatly harmed Romania. Just as the doors opened to religious freedom, they opened to freedoms for evil that had not been allowed under communism. Heavy rock music and fads from the West are pouring in. Pornography is sold openly on sidewalk tables in view of all. Television programs that must be purchased from cable in America are beamed freely to all in Romania. Our heads hung in shame as we learned that the filthiest of American pornography is now polluting that land. A non-Christian commented to Virginia that she didn't understand why, when the gospel came from America, did the worst imaginable filth and sick things now come? What can we say in answer, and how can we not believe that God will judge our land for spreading its pollution of filth to the ends of the earth? And then finally, another little uh, paragraph here. When I heard Demetra speak these words, I was grief-stricken because I knew they were true. He went on to share that God had brought him to America to warn this country of coming destruction if it did not repent. He said that God would not tolerate our sins much longer and would soon lift his protective hand from us. When this happens, he said, parts of America would burn, being destroyed by fire resulting from an attack. Dimitri, however, also said that God dearly loved the people of this country and had taken note of the many Christians over the years who had served him faithfully and had spread his gospel message around the world. He said that God wanted to spare and protect us, but if America didn't repent soon, it would be too late. And then finally, a few years ago, Dimitri Dimitri went on to be with the Lord. He continued to preach this message until the very day he died, never retracting his statements. His words resonated with me. And again, that is Gary, who we're speaking with here tonight, and stuck in my mind, I believe, because I felt the same way. Well, that was a very powerful, the whole article was powerful, to be honest. But that, I just believe that that particular section, I mean, there was a few others, too, that I really also liked just as well, would speak to people and um, that you actually had a chance to meet um, Dimitri Dudman. I mean, that was awesome. What was that like? And uh, did he say anything else to you that was noteworthy like that? Um, but I, I believe at that time I saw the, the beginnings of what I felt God beginning to lift his hand of protection off of America. And today I see that happening even more. And, and God is, is uh, patient. He's, he's more patient than we are. He really is. I never want to bet against God's love and patience. He's been very patient to wait this long. But 
increasingly I see him lifting his hand of protection off of America because of the lack of repentance. And Dimitri warned about that point in time coming, and he shared with me that when there would be some type of commotion in in the heartland of the country, in the middle part of the country, um, and it, it what he seemed to describe could have been rioting or or fighting or some type of uprising, something like that taking place. He said when our country would be preoccupied with something taking place internally, that we would be attacked by our enemies and a number of cities would be wiped out. And it grieved him so greatly that he could hardly talk about this. But he was absolutely convinced God had uh, shown him this and brought him to America to warn the United States to repent and turn back to him. And uh, he described uh, several of the coastal cities on the West Coast and the East Coast being being taken out through some type of uh, nuclear incident. And um, what I found interesting was that Um, and I don't know how far I want to go on this. I'll just give you a a, a very quick uh, capsule. Uh, Years ago, I was in an organization. I did not write about this organization uh, because it, it, it dealt with national security issues. But the types of scenarios that were described when I was in that organization that could result in a type of emergency declaration and a martial law situation lined up with what Dimitri was warning America about that would happen. So I was literally getting it from both sides, hearing from the one end that this is something that could take place and and seeing how eventually um, certain powers could be kicked into effect that could, in theory, be used to t- to force the United States into a type of a world government system. And then on the other hand, uh, a, a bold Christian pastor from Romania coming to the United States uh, to warn the United States of, of what was coming. So I, I do believe that at some point in time, if America does not repent, uh, God is going to allow these things to happen. And we we are a very, very proud nation. And I don't want to bash America. You know, I've been privileged to live here and have the freedoms that that I've had, the son of European immigrants who went through World War II and came here to get away from from the kinds of things that uh, took place there. Um, But at the same time, um, there is no other country on earth that boasts of how great it is and how powerful it is. And, And one thing that God hates is pride. Uh, Lucifer was expelled from heaven because of pride. And when you hear a country consistently boasting, we are the greatest, we're the most powerful, we have the world's greatest economy, on and on and on. And then uh, uh, to go beyond that and and to rack up the kind of sin that that we have over these last 20, 30, 40 years, whether it's it's abortion or the fact that 80% of the world's pornography, I've been told, is uh, is coming from the United States, much of it through the Internet, and, and on and on and on. Our, our movies, we've affected the entire culture of the world. The first nation ever, really, to do that. Rome did it to some degree, but not uh, comp- truly globally like the United States has in our time. And so we've gone from being a, a very... Uh, solid nation that has had an overall a good impact on the world to now where um, we're, we're producing filth. And even our money that we give to other nations is now uh, on many occasions contingent upon the, um, uh, uh, upon what other nations decide regarding sexual matters. Um, and if, if um, uh, certain countries go along with uh, things that this administration deems important, uh, then they'll receive our money. If they uh, defy the United States, they won't receive any. So we've become a negative influence on the world from a standpoint of morality. It's true. We don't want to hear that. We don't want to believe it. But everybody listening right now knows that I'm speaking the truth. Now, unless we repent, there will be consequences. We have to repent now. Uh, the only thing I regret is that I'm probably, to a large extent, preaching to the choir, but I'm hoping that's not the case. I'm hoping there are a lot of listeners hearing this program right now uh, who maybe have not been Christians or who are lukewarm Christians, who are getting the message and feel a tug on their heart, realizing that God is trying to get their attention and, and call them to repentance and to a, a, a complete faith and walk with Jesus Christ. So um, we need to be in prayer 
we need to be seeking God's will individually, each one of us for our own lives, as to what He would have us specifically do at this point in time. And He will be faithful to show us what He wants us to do. Yeah, and our time's about up, but I wanted I wanted to make a comment on something, but I had to ask. Didn't Dimitri Dudeman first come to, to the United States with this message in the late 70s or early 80s? Do you remember? Well, I remember throughout the 80s that he preached this message, and he did so all the way up until, I think it was 1996 when he, when he passed on. And I uh, had the opportunity of meeting with him two or three times in Wisconsin. I know his grandson uh, to this day who served as his interpreter. He's a good friend of mine, Michael Boldia. And um, uh, it's interesting that what Dimitri was speaking and what I was learning and what the Lord was putting on my heart, it, we were on the same page together. And to me, it was a confirmation because I believed the same things. Uh, but at the time, I felt incredibly lonely. After I left my job with the government, which, by the way, I was given an ultimatum to keep quiet or, or risk losing my job. And so I finally left, and I had made a commitment as, as a young person that I would take a stand for the Lord if we were ever faced with anything in this country like what the Europeans faced during World War II. And so believing God was taking me up on that, I actually left my job and began working on, on my book, and it took six long years to research and write that early 1992. But during that time, I, I did feel very lonely, except for the Lord being with me and my wife standing with me. Uh, I, I'm telling you, the spiritual battles we faced, uh, you know, it, it would take an hour to go into it alone. Um, but we came through it, and the Lord is faithful. And, and uh, But I received a lot of encouragement shortly after my book came out when I saw uh, uh, other people, including Dimitri Dudeman being one of them, uh, that the Lord had revealed the same things to, uh, to warn America that the time is short and the American people need to repent. That's the bottom line. Yes, amen to that. And um, interestingly enough, you and I are both from Kettering, Ohio, originally. I never, I know there's an age difference between us, so I, I don't believe our paths probably ever crossed, but that's interesting. But I wanted to say... Um, you know, when I had asked you about Dimitri, I think it's quite interesting and really shows God's patience because you had mentioned God being patient earlier. It really shows God's patience and His love for us because if you look at David Wilkerson and Dimitri Dudeman, uh, David Wilkerson was warning America back in the 70s, and then, then came Dimitri back in the 80s. Okay, so God warned America way back when, and this is how many years He has given us and, and been long-suffering and patient from the time He originally started warning this nation till now. I mean, that was many years of warning, and um, people need to look at that, and I do believe, I believe wholeheartedly that we are on the precipice of some very, very big prophetic events that are getting ready to happen. And just keep in mind, prophecy has to be fulfilled. The reason it's being fulfilled is because God wants to judge sin and Satan and the kingdom of hell. And this nation isn't repenting as a whole. There's people repenting in the nation, but the nation as a whole, as we've discussed, isn't repenting. So God has been, God has sent us many people to warn to warn us, but the two that come to my mind right now is Dimitri Dudeman and David Wilkerson, both. And I just want to encourage everybody, and I'll ask you in a second, Gary, if you have any final thoughts, but I just want to encourage everybody to go to GaryKa.org. That is G-A-R-Y-K-A-H dot org. And he does have some links there to his to some DVDs and his books. Be sure and check them out because he has a lot of knowledge and a lot of interesting Wake up call type information. Gary, did you have anything else you'd wanted to share with the listeners before we end the program? Well, ju just that that God gives nations time to repent. He he warns and warns patiently, but eventually, uh, if those warnings are unheeded, then judgment does come. We'd be the first nation in the history of the world uh, to get to the point where we are and not be judged by God. And so people need to take this seriously, but there is good news at the end of all of this, and that is, again, that those of us who believe in Jesus and walk with Him, uh, we are guaranteed eternity with Him, 
And eternity does mean eternity. It's forever. So it is worth it. It is uh, worth uh, carrying our cross in this world and being faithful to the Lord. And He will certainly be faithful to us. Amen. That is so true. He is a faithful, loving God. And we don't always understand the ways of His love because we're not God. And He specifically says in the Bible that our ways are nothing alike. And we may not, like I said, understand everything God has to say or everything that He does, but that's where we have to have faith. And as I always say, faith isn't getting what you want. Faith is when you don't get what you want, but you trust God's plan anyways. And sometimes we all have to make steps of faith that we just don't understand. Again, please visit Gary at his website, GaryKah.org. That's G-A-R-Y-K-A-H. This message will not only be aired on the radio networks, but it will also be uploaded to my YouTube channel. That's the Lindley Oz YouTube channel. So be sure and check it out and share it with others so they too can wake up, repent, and hear the truth. God bless everyone. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Lynn.